Hey, welcome back to another bigger esports podcast. In this episode, we've got Jeffrey Pabs, the Chief Revenue Officer of FaZe Clan, coming back for podcast number two. It's been almost one year since he's come. He was pretty new into the job last time. We talk about this on the podcast. He's obviously been in the company for quite some time now. And FaZe is almost an entirely different organization internally now than it was back then. We talk about imposter syndrome. We talk about other teams not doing enough for their sponsors yet again. We talk about FaZe merchandise and how they're turning themselves into much more than just a company that does collab drops and signs influences. I love the chat. Hopefully you do too. All the people on the LinkedIn live had some very positive comments to talk about it as well. Once again, one of my favorite episodes, but I feel like pretty much every single episode I'm doing right now is my favorite. If you'd like to see any kind of different topics or guests or whatever else, suggest them. Let me know what you'd like to see. Leave a comment down below or leave a review rating, or you can contact us directly. Contact at bigesports.gg. Enjoy. We're live, Jeff. How are you? What's going on, Chris? How you doing, man? Good, good. You were talking, or you reminded me just before we went live that we're pretty much one year since our last podcast together. So our last podcast was October the third, twenty nineteen, in Australian time. It's it, it's October the first today. So we're we're just two days off one year. I mean, nothing's happened since, right? <laughs> no, no. Well, if nothing else, previously you were audio only, and now you now you're in HD video. So there you go. I mean, I'm live streaming. I got to make sure I don't botch this on LinkedIn, man. <laughs> That's true. Actually, you had the power of editing last time. So if there was, because because thinking about it, there were a couple of times I remember I've I've done podcasts with some people and they've gone, they sent me a message after and gone, shoot, Chris, I wasn't uh, I wasn't allowed to say that. Uh, you know, some numbers or some investment or some announcement that they weren't supposed to talk about, and they've they've made me delete it. But unfortunately, you're you're live now, so you know. I, mean, I definitely had a little bit of nerves, like right after. I'm like, what did I say? Because you don't get that. <laughs> audio cut afterwards and you know i've been at the company six months at that time and i remember being like did i say something stupid and you know what are people going to think so um i thought it turned out great um it's been really impressive to watch a lot of your work and what you guys are doing with big esports down in australia man your graphics yeah. your updates twenty thousand followers um you're like the the modern day linkedin uh host uh if you will <laughs> you're crushing it so keep it up and my girlfriend likes to annoy me she calls me the number one link fluencer and, uh, we've got a, yeah, we've got a few golden rules at home um, to kind of separate from work. Number one is we don't talk about LinkedIn, and number number two, the word esports is actually banned when we, when we talk to each other because it's the only time that I get to. I mean, I'm working from home like you are, so I try to have like a little bit of time where I can switch my brain off. But she likes to she likes to get those digs in. <laughs> I feel like that's fair. Uh, fun fact: I actually control our company's LinkedIn page, which is. Yeah. Uh, you know, I spend so much time on there. I actually have some amazing stories about using the platform. Uh, I actually helped find one of our biggest clients, literally a cold outreach. and was like, hey, did you see this article? Let's chat. And they're uh, one of our biggest partners. And I can't go into exactly who it was, but it all took place yeah. on LinkedIn. I hired three of my best people. Uh, we've gotten connected. And I feel like I've been such a sponge off of the content. And the thing that's yeah. funny as well about LinkedIn is how quickly your community and your feed changes. Like it might always be music, it was ad tech, and now it's just, it's you <laughs> and everybody else uh, at FaZe Clan, Esports Observer, Dexerto, it's it's all of the above, man. Yeah, I, I really do hope that some other people start creating more content like we're doing on the platform. Because I mean, you you know, you just been talking positively about it and I've become a LinkedIn shill. It's, it's very common to read on Twitter, people hating on it. But there's there's trash on LinkedIn like there is on every platform. If you follow the wrong people on Instagram, all you're going to get is booty pics, tummy tees, and selfies. And the same on same on Twitter. You know, you're just going to get people spamming their stream. And same on Facebook, you're going to get a lot of people arguing in the comments. So I think if you surround yourself with the right people, but I've experienced exactly the same stuff that you said like our business partners place studios they've just announced an ipo last week i met them through linkedin they reached out to me um my first client that paid me over five thousand dollars linkedin we're working on a reality show at the moment that was linkedin working with our largest client is in saudi arabia linkedin like i think like for you know while we're based in australia we've probably got 80 percent of our work and 90 to 95 percent of our revenue comes from overseas and out of that at least 80 percent of that is directly through linkedin you know, besides the work we do with Unicorn, besides the work we do with NVIDIA and their partners here with Influencer Work, it's all it's all LinkedIn based. So, yeah. you know, I could, couldn't talk any more highly about it. I think that, you know, there are, we were talking about it a minute ago, it's like they're relatively like people that have, have a ton of information to share and wealth of knowledge. And, you know, kind of one of the things that's just super important is we're all kind of figuring it out. And I found the like the business community that's supporting esports and gaming, like we're very receptive to sharing information. Like, 
what is working for you guys? What are we doing with measurement? Um, what's your approach? And, and I don't think it was that way two years ago. I feel like everybody was just trying to fend for themselves a little bit more. And, you know, I think that's the beauty of kind of what we're building. It's like, I'm a big proponent of rising tides lifts all boats. And, you know, if I can learn something more from reading your content and it helps you, you know, secure business, like that's a perfect opportunity that it's a, it's a win-win. And more often than not, when you're creating content and you can generate a lead, like, you're kind of building your own acquisition funnel for clients. And it's, it's a really powerful thing that you're doing and I respect the hell out of it. Yeah, that's good, man. We, I really hope that, you know, I really hope that some more people start creating content on this platform. You know, my, my right hand man here Bax, who's the guy that actually does all the graphics and the direction. He's a game developer. So that's where his experience comes from. He's going to start posting more, but yeah, I really hope people start, you know, creating more content on this space because we need more, we dare I say, we need more LinkedIn influencers that don't just post, you know, one sentence, one sentence paragraph fake stories is about how actually I made a post this morning about a guy making fun of them it was like, you know, I was walking to work in the rain and there was a dog standing out there and I gave the dog some food cause it looks hungry. And then I went to a job interview and the boss was the dog. <laughs> just like, you know, just, just crap like that. You, you see that quite often, like, you, you know, just want to see that quality content. And like you said, like the, the reason I started growing on LinkedIn is literally I would read an article and I would say, well, that helped me. I would just share it because it'll probably help someone else too. If I like it, I'm sure someone else likes it. Totally. I think for me, like it was something I was viewed maybe five years ago. It was, it was a tool to like prospect sales leads and see, you know, information. Can I use in my email outreach? And now it's just a, mm. it's a, it's a content. Like I'm not on Facebook, uh, kind of by design. I'm on Twitter, but I just follow our entire all our campaigns and our talent and our main channels. Like if you look at my Instagram, mm. my Twitter, it is phase clan, phase clan, phase clan, and then Labradors. That's like, <laughs> that's like the, the combination of what you see on there. Yeah. So, um, this is my, yeah. my, uh, my, my education, my book. So, uh, you can be my Yoda. Mm. So let's do it. <laughs> Fantastic. So I guess like a quick recap for anyone watching or listening, the, the main topics that we talked about last time that, that I got out of it. Number one was, a stat that I've used in every panel conference meeting since since then, which is FaZe Clan sold a million dollars worth in champion hoodies in the first hour of your collab drop. Um, we also talked about how, you know, you and, and FaZe as a whole takes very seriously kind of the leadership position you have in the market, trying to make sure that you're delivering, you know, quality towards the brands that partner with you and, and some concern around traditional esports teams maybe not driving as much, um, driving as much value for the top level teams. And we also talked about you just came off the back of, you know, a fortnight World Cup meetup that had a line of 16 city blocks of kids to come, come and meet you. And then also you came off the back of another four live meetups as well. So we talked a little bit about, you know, the increase in merchandise and the increase in you working with other companies, but also when is, when is it too much? When, when are you doing too many drops? You know, when is there fatigue for the market? You know, when does face stop signing people and things like that too? So I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to leave with that one. If nothing yeah. else, you guys are doing even more than ever before, right? Like you just did a drop with a luxury drop with box of heat. Um, you did a drop not too long ago with, um, uh, with the antisocial social club, you know, you've done some with lyrical lemonade, you've done more and more and more with champion Manchester city, et cetera, et cetera. So do you, do you guys um, have an idea on, on the pace of that? Are you going to, going to continue this pace forever? Yeah. So I think that there's a, sometimes a misconception and I think it was a trap that I feel like we fell into in 2019 where our product became the products that we sold. And unfortunately, like we've kind of taken a step back and like reposition, like what is phase clan, right? And I remember I used this example, like we're like a Wu-Tang collective, we're stronger together. And, you know, it's really different in our perception of ourselves in 2020. Like we view ourselves as a gaming content and media company first. Um, you know, uh, who also does esports. It's like, if you view like uh, Disney, for example, they're a media company. They own one of the biggest studios uh, in the world. Mm -hmm. They create content for children, but they're also in the travel business. They have cruise ships, they have parks. And that's kind of how we view a lot of our esports where it's like gaming content and our talent sit at the center of it. And then esports is uh, an aspect of it. But, um, you know, we've learned a lot. Like, I think 2019 was a year where we really, like, professionalized, um, you know, a lot of our uh, kind of like shortfalls. We were going from a company that wasn't a company. Like, our CEO, Lee Trank, took control of the company in August of 2018. And, you know, over the last two years, like, we took a really big brand with a huge footprint, but there was no business infrastructure. There was no strategy. And I think, you know, earlier this year, we onboarded a, a new COO, JC Hayes. Um, you want to talk about gaming OGs? Like we all talk about, we've been in gaming for two years, four years, five years. Uh, she's been in gaming since 1996. Um, and she's seen it all. Um, 
she worked at CBS Interactive. CBS Interactive actually used to do uh, sales for Twitch in its early days when it was Justin TV, gave them their first like real break. And you look at like the monstrosity that they've come. And, mm. you know, this year it's all about doing things that we want to do that are bigger for the brand. The bigger the brand, the better our content performs, the better our talent um, and our brand partners' uh, performances. And then if we can sell merch on the back end of that, then that's a, a perfect kind of funnel. Like it's just an acquisition funnel for us to sell product. But if all we're selling is product, all we're, you know, we're, we're no different than, you know, going to target. And that's not the brand that we want to be. Um, and on the merch side, like we've really created more of a cadence with how we do drops from learning from a lot of our mistakes, to be perfectly honest, like we made some mistakes in 2019 and we're not going to replicate those again. Mm. So do you see it as um, like, like how do you split up your assets in a phase clan? I assume you've got, you know, you've kind of got your phase house, you've got your wider influences. I mean, you even have a New Zealand that lives in Australia. You've got some, um, you know, kind of your merch division and then you've got your esports team as well. Is that, is that how you split it up internally? And then you decide what, what you're trying to sell, like based on those. No, I think it's, it's actually a little bit more simple than that. Um, we used to say we have like six business units and it's, so we create content, uh, mm -hmm. the best game content, the best gaming lifestyle content, the best celebrity content, you know, tremendous power, 227 million followers off of all of our channels. We have the biggest talent in the world. Uh, and what I mean by that are people like Nick Merckx who re-signed with us for another three years. And, you know, he is such a legend and somebody that we want to really get behind and we want to help him continue to build his brand. We have people like FaZe Rug who, you know, you have to, to remember, like a lot of esports uh, teams and orgs and media companies want the players to do all their work for the org, right? And I think a little bit different for us is we want to empower content creators to build their own brand. And now their brands are massive. Like FaZe Rug, he's in his own movie. Um, he has 30 million followers. Each video he does does five to 10 million followers. He's in a David Dobrik category. We have Nick Merckx and then we have these emerging like rising stars, which are super important to us, right? And we, our, our signing we did earlier this year, FaZe Swag, um, he is arguably one of the most high profile streamers on Twitch right now. Brands all want to work with them. His growth is unparalleled uh, right now. And we want to be able to bring these rising stars and cultivate them in the right way. You also remember like uh, esports and talent, like we're now getting into this gen two gen two is going to be much more calculated. It, you know, our, we're one of the very few teams that actually has 360 management in house. Um, it's run by a guy named Darren Yan. Uh, who is so good. He came from UTA. He's been working with some of the biggest content creators, streamers, people like Pokimane, Nick Merckx before that. And so he's coming to our talent being like, all right, you need to be disciplined. You need to work really hard. Here's how you grow your audience. And we're going to support you. And, you know, our ability to have 30 million followers off of all of our channels gives us this platform. And then there's the secondary thing where our talent support each other. Like that's, and, and that you don't really see that a lot. Um, you know, you, you do see Ninja and Tim the Tatman and they support each other, but people who are coming up very often, it's more of a selfish thing. So we want to provide the infrastructure and then there's the esports side, right? It's a slightly different audience. It's older, it's more global. And we've seen that there's a very different audience that follows our Instagram and our YouTube. than you know, we'll go to watch a, a CSGO match at, at you know, Katowice, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, if we do all of those things, right, we do, uh, content. We do talent, we do esports. We're naturally going to sell a ton of stuff, and that addressable market is going to be that much larger. And if we can maintain it uh, and continue to do really cool like collabs, like um, we're going to make sure that Phase is still, you know, looked at as like an edgy, like culture driven, you know, like a Nike, if you will, of the gaming world, which is kind of what we want to become. Mm, mm. And, I, and one other thing I wanted to highlight as well um, is your partnership with Control or CTRL. I can see Skylar Johnson in the chat talking about as well so for those who don't know it's a it's a meal replacement drink you know the the one of the founders skylar johnson a real og of the call of duty industry so obviously that's a tie-in with phase there and, and your history can you can you talk a little bit about how that partnership works i believe the press release mentioned you guys are some sort of co-owner or business partner in the venture you know why why did you decide to go with that and, and is that something that phase is going to be looking more into in the future I think we want to explore all business models, to be honest. Like, 
you know, in the past, like if you think about like five years ago in gaming, like what it looked like, it was like affiliate codes and tracking codes and everybody puts in their code and you can make extra money, but nobody was getting paid up front. Right. So yeah. for us, yeah. like, you know, we have our bigger sponsors, like the G fuels, which is a sponsorship agreement. We don't have ownership in G fuel. And so, uh, control and Skylar, uh, came to who's like friends of phase. He knows all of our OG talent. Uh, he knows our head of esports very well. Um, he's like, Hey, we want to launch this company. Here's what the market opportunity. Um, are you interested in taking ownership stake? And, you know, I think you're going to see more esports teams operate in those types of ways, right? Traditional media companies all operate that way. Um, you look at Disney, like Disney took, you know, a vested stake in device. It didn't work out very well. Uh, but those things happen a lot. And I think, you know, there's all about the, the diversification of your portfolio of how you make money, right? So, you know, we make money from sponsorships. We make money from products. Uh, we make money from esports winnings. And, you know, the long term goal is, you know, we can have equity. We can help build up a brand like Control um, and make it, you know, a really large company. And then we all win. We all benefit. Um, and I think, you know, Control plays in, in that ecosystem with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and we're definitely on the same page there because because you bet I'm coming to you with a with an offer very similar, <laughs> very soon with with a, with the company that we're working on. But I think it works. I think it works that way not only with with teams but but with influencers and then also traditional people, right? So like I gave an example on my LinkedIn the other day. I was doing some I was doing some mentoring with a small esports team here in Australia. You know, you could call them a tier three or tier four. I think they maybe have one affiliate sponsor. That's it. And near the end of our hour together, they mentioned that a current UFC world champion is their personal friend and lives like five doors down for them. And I said, yeah. guys, and, and, he, and he's a gamer. I was like, guys, hang up the call right now. Go to his house and say, I will give you 10% of my company. Let's go. Like, it, because if, if nothing else, the influencers are the marketing budget, right? So if you're giving money to FaZe and you're doing drops with FaZe like you are with, with Control, then you don't need to spend any of that money on influencer marketing because you are that. You know, it's exactly the same as what Playside, our partner, does when they do influencer apps. You don't need to spend a ton of money on churning through Google ads and, and looking at your cost per acquisition because the influencers who are creating the app with you are your marketing. It's something they're passionate about. It's something they talk about all the time. And that's one thing I've always enjoyed about phase is phase is g fuel and g fuel is phase and you know when I mean. <laughs> yeah and i and i use that example working with a competitor of, of yours with ghost with ghost gamer saying to them like look at what phase do with g fuel you need to have that integration you can't just sponsor the team and they do a few tweets on their team account it's got to be the thing the thing it's got to be the thing that the players think about all the time it's what they're pushing on their stream it's what they're drinking every day when they're creating content it's them coming to you with ideas because we've seen this i've seen this a lot from my friends and i'm sure you've seen it too but you know when a when a big brand comes and just sponsors only the team you know you get a logo on the jersey you get a few tweets and it really just doesn't drive anything at all you need the buy in from the players totally i think g fuel is a prime example you know they're one of the ogs in the space they've been doing this for almost a yep. decade just like the 10 years that we've been doing it as well. Like our brands are interlinked. Um, and it's funny, like don't be wrong, a relationship with a brand that lasts that long has its highs and lows. Um, you know, I'm happy to report our relationship with those guys is the best that it's ever been. I think we're doing some of our best work. Um, we're communicating more than we ever have. Um, you know, we have four cans. Uh, so we have nine total products that are available in stores. Um, they help promote our brand constantly. They interact with our talent. Um, if we have requests, they're like, oh, totally. Let's go do X, Y, and Z. You know, we're also doing our phase five and they're offering up, you know, $100,000 to the five winners. And then they're also offering up another sponsorship opportunity for each one of those five. So, you know, it's a few hundred thousand dollars in addition to, you know, our long run. And so we renewed them in February and, you know, we have every intention to, you know, in 10 years from now to still be looking at our relationship being like, Hey, we are global brands together and we can both agree that we've benefited. Um, I also just love the team over there, like, like Cliff and Sal and Nick and Jack. Um, they're just, they're really open and we can always count on them. We're very, very lucky to have a partner like that, which is why they're on the front of our jersey. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I guess that's that's something we talked about quite a lot in the last in the last podcast and then also in some of our personal chats as well, which is about phases look at going away, not completely, but going away from the traditional sports and esports team sponsorship model of 12 to 36 months, locking yourself into exclusive categories and looking at those, how can you create content for those quick wins? So like an easy example is when you guys help to launch the Rebel Whopper um, with Burger King, right? You can be paid to do a certain amount of content. And that also from a commercial aspect opens you up to three months later working with McDonald's potentially on a release and working with Chipotle, et cetera. Is, is that still something that you're going towards? Obviously G Fuel, um, 
you know, isn't, isn't that kind of model, but is that something that you're still striving towards selling content? Totally. So, um, you know, I would say a little bit different position than we were at a year ago to where we're at now is that we have a lot more longer term 12 month contracts than we did at that time. Um, but we still do a lot of media one-offs, uh, programs that happen. Um, this year we've done a little bit less frequently. Um, you know, earlier this year we renewed G fuel, we renewed Nissan, uh, we onboarded Verizon, uh, we onboarded beats by Dre. And so they've kept us really busy and, um, they're great partners and, you know, so that hasn't necessarily opened us up to do as much one-off work. Um, but I do agree, like, um, you know, the one thing that is really important to know is like, we very rarely will do anything longer than 12 months. Um, I think it's more important now, like what is, uh, October when we talk a year from now, right? Like we talked about how different it was a year ago to where we're at now, to where we're going to yeah. be next year. Like, holy, I, I can, I can guess tomorrow or next week what's going to happen, but I have no idea what it's going to look like. And, you know, I think the same thing with a lot of brands and sponsors who have come into the space. Um, but you know, another important aspect is we start talking more of this, like holding company about like diversification and monetization opportunities. Um, you know, we are, uh, we launched a few things earlier this year, uh, a movie partnership with a company called invisible narratives. Um, uh, uh, some senior paramount Disney executives were releasing our first feature length film next month called crimson with phase rug. There are going to be cameos throughout. We announced a phase studios partnership with Michael sugar. who's the same, um, director who did spotlight. Um, so highbrow stuff, they're going to be, our partner for long form content that lives on the streaming services scripted. So, you know, you hopefully you'll be seeing us sometime in 2021 uh, with content on Netflix uh, that's scripted. Uh, and then we've got some developments coming out where we're uh, basically building out an in-house uh, brand creative studio, which there's going to be more to come in the next few months. Um, we want to be the hub for, for the best like edgy creators, whether you're self-taught or, you know, you're an Emmy winning producer. We, we want to help, you know, empower brands, not only to run uh, content that lives on our channels, but their channels, um, which I think is maybe the evolution of what you're going to see from Faceplan as a media company first. Is that, and is that where you see the scale coming from? You know, I think there's a, I think there's a couple of bets if you were to look at, you know, the first esports team to reach a billion dollars. I think a lot of people say, you know, it could be phase, it could be hundred thieves, but it's, it's some of these teams that focus on content. I mean, NRG is making some serious plays into that as well. Is, is that where you see like a lot of your scale coming from? Because there's only so many 12 month sponsorships you can sell, right? Totally. Um, I think you, you have to think that way. I think, you know, what does this look like in five years? You know, I think one of the things that uh, I think we've seen with the pandemic with like esports, just the volatility on the competitive side, right? Everything's been disrupted. You know, you just saw Activision announce yesterday they're allowing their, their franchises to defer payments. Um, you know, mm -hmm. the, only, the only league that I think has been relatively unscathed has just been League of Legends with Riot. Um, I mean, the amount of brands that are you know, working with them is unlike anything I've ever seen influx of new brands that are coming in. And I think, you know, for, for everybody, um, you know, we've got to figure out what the model is. Is it going to be, we're a media and content studio or talent management. Uh, we have esports. Do we do events? Crazy thing is uh, at the start of uh, 2020, all we were focused on was doing a 4,000 person event in Los Angeles called phase X. We hired people and it was going to be to celebrate our 10th anniversary. It was going to be like a complex con meets Twitch con meets phase fest. And, you know, yeah. I think that there's going to be a, a world where gaming gets bigger and you're going to be able to have these complementary businesses. Um, you may see certain esports teams and orgs uh, develop their own IP around games. Like, mm -hmm. don't get me wrong, like I, we've definitely explored like buying games and promoting those games and building a community around it. And some of them are, these games are great. You know, they just don't have the, the marketing muscle and that's where we can come in. And mm. to your point earlier about, you know, working with uh, particular influencers to be your marketing budget and, you know, some of the stuff that we do with like control, I think you're going to see more and more of that because I, I do think a collective like FaZe Clan can make or break a game. I do believe that. Um, mm. We were one of the very first... Uh, one of the very first times Nick Merckx played Warzone uh, was in our first tournament, which was the first day of lockdown. And we were like, hey, the whole world's going lockdown. Let's throw a Warzone tournament. Like, what were we thinking? And it turned out to be like yeah. one of the highlights of my almost two years at the company. Yeah, you're definitely right about, I mean, influence as a whole make or breaking a game, right? You've got that, you've got that massive power of, um, 
you know, just, just the sheer influencer power. We saw that with Apex Legends, right? They pay pretty much every top influencer to jump on the game. You know, they got 50 million downloads. Thankfully for me as an ex-competitive player, the game was very good as well, but they weren't able to continue that for a couple of reasons. A, you know, they had to pay the influencers. So when the influencers stopped, you know, getting paid, they stopped doing it. But B, they were very lax in the content where it took them, you know, two months to release season one that came with like one map and two skins and everybody just dropped it like like Woody and Toy Story and jumped back to back to Fortnite once again, right? Yeah, totally. Think, think about like March of this year, like you had uh, uh, Warzone, you had Valorant coming in, you've seen literally like uh, uh, Fall Guys, we've seen Omega, like we've seen all these games kind of come and go. Um, yeah. And I think it's really interesting to see like with Star, the, the staying power is like clearly Warzone is, is that from a competitive side, like Valorant is just this game. And like we, we did uh, in one of the legs of the ignition series in North America and we shattered every record. And I think it actually got us rethinking, like, should we be hosting digital events and promotion that then led into us uh, doing a phase uh, Twitch rivals, with, uh, it's called a phase face off, which is really hard to say phase face off. Um, we just did that like two weeks ago. So there's no reason why we could not be, you know, at our own tournament organizer and creating these, you know, tent pole events, especially for the next like nine months where the world is a little bit uncertain. Um, you know, we can market these things and we've seen just unparalleled relationships like like our ignition series event, which was sponsored by Verizon and Nissan who helped underwrite it. Like we had 200,000 concurrence, which almost rivaled some of like the, the League of Legends LCS stuff that was taking place um, that same weekend. Yeah. I mean, you know, so I think everybody's figuring it out and it's, it's a ton of fun. And, you know, I'm, I mean, every day I'm facing a new challenge and I think all of us are just the pace We're, you know, I think for me personally, like the pace of working at phase clan is unlike anything I've ever done. Like, uh, we, you know, there was one week about two months ago where, uh, on a Monday we announced we're doing our, our Twitch phase rivals. The Tuesday we announced Ben Simmons uh, joining Phase Clan as an investor and officially becoming known as Phase Simo. That Wednesday we announced our settlement with Tifu. Uh, that Thursday we announced Anti-Social Social Club drop that was taking place on Saturday. Uh, on Saturday we did the drop. It sold out. We sold a ten thousand dollar custom PC. Uh, we sold half a million dollars in product in like thirty seconds. Right. Um, mm. That led into us uh, on Call of Duty playing in the in the World Finals. You know, we lost, unfortunately, uh, to Dallas. Uh, and then that Sunday, we announced Bronny joining FaZe Clan. That is a week. And it, and it encapsulates what it's like to work here. And it, it's not for everybody, to be honest. Like, um, I, I struggled with it at the very beginning. Um, now, we're just creating more project management about how we can actually support this stuff. Because I'm being, holy shit, this stuff is, it, it moves fast. And we want to make a lot of big bets and big noise. And um, to be honest, knock on wood, it's for the most part, it's working. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's crazy. I mean, you know, if if you're a company that's releasing that many products, the closest I've ever been is Corsair. When I think we had like, you know, when I was there, they had like 13 product lines, and that's before they bought Elgato, before they bought Origin. So I don't envy the PR marketing crew there. But it it felt like it was becoming too much, or becoming like a Seuss when you go to Computex and they hand you their manual of everything a Seuss makes. It's like this thick, full of full of you know high quality paper. So that goes back to that same question, I guess. How how do you know when it becomes too much for phase or is, is the scalability of your digital audience, you know, ex- accepting with that, you know, are you reaching so many new members within new different parties that you can just keep cranking out more and more releases? So I, I think that there's, there's, there's two things that kind of come into play, right? If you bastardize your audience with either your partners and ads or you selling stuff, um, the stickiness of engagement of your content goes down. And I've seen it. Like, so we have a threshold that we always look at of our social assets, whether it's Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, what is an acceptable amount that we can dedicate either towards a drop uh, or one of our brand partners? Usually it's, it's less than 10%. Um, and you know, there, we learned a valuable lesson where we violated that rule last December and we pushed such a heavy retail message at the same time that we were doing four drops all stacked on one another and we had a store pop up and it was fatigue not only for our social channels it was fatigue for our fans who were being bombarded with buy 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 versus like phase is really good at just selling like you're part of this thing right and you know we love our fans like if we lose that we we that we can do irreparable damage to like the long-term brand um and as such like all of us at the end of december were like 
what just happened? Like, um, you know, in the pursuit of trying to build, you know, a giant merch business, like we lost sight that we are a media company with fans. We have talent who need to support the stuff. And if we're just telling them to go show up at a store over and over and over again, they get tired. Um, and then that just leads into lack of interest in our esports. So it's like all there's a there's connection and, you know, December was a, was a, a moment where we, we got back in January and we're like, how do we not do that ever again? Um, and you know, so now we have everything count. Like literally it's like, we do a certain drop this date. This is how long it goes up for. Um, we also do at the same time with a lot of our basics. Um, people, you know, we, people always love to highlight like our juice world drop. We did, you know, did $3 million in sales, um, over, over a few day period. But the, the challenge, um, you know, with those is like, you don't want to just then do another one of those two weeks later because it doesn't make it as special. And so we mm-hmm. we're going to focus a little bit more on scarcity and limited quantities and, and making sure that, you know, that if you are lucky enough to get one of our products, that it means a lot to you. Mm. I like, I like that idea you were saying about the scarcity. I like, you know, I mentioned before you did a, you did a phase, um, a phase heat drop recently, right? So for those people who don't know, heat sell kind of these luxury merchandise boxes. And I thought it was a really interesting concept. So they did a, a partnership with you guys at phase where they gave one to two pieces of exclusive phase merch and then one to two pieces of high end, you know, some sort of off whites or Balenciaga or Gucci style, style of merchandise. And I thought that was good. And I guess building the scarcity has worked really well for, you know, who I would claim is probably your main competitor, 100 Thieves in the market. So it's interesting that you want to go towards that. I've seen, I've seen you guys do that a couple of times before, right? I think with, um, with one of your investors, you did a couple of drops. You said sold out in like 30 seconds and things like that. So how do, you, how do you as a chief revenue officer then justify that? Because if you can sell $3 million worth of Juice World merch at a margin, that's some great revenue coming to you. But what if you're limiting it to only 100 units? Like how do you, how do you justify that internally to your board in, in the loss in revenue there? I think that there's a, a balance, right? If, if I went to Target or Walmart and was like, hey, can I sell you this license and can I make FaZe Clan shirts? I'd probably get paid $10 million a year, mm. right? But at what cost, right? Um, you know, FaZe doesn't become this like sacred thing to our fan base, which largely consists of, you know, 14 to 24 year old males. Like, it, you know, we don't want to become the Lakers yet, right? Like, don't get me wrong. Like the whole goal is to be, Um, the gold standard in media and content and sports, but it's too early on to just make it readily available. And, you know, I I always use this brand, which is kind of funny. Um, It is for some reason, it's actually made a comeback more more recently. I don't even remember Von Dutch. Remember Von Dutch? You know, it was like Kristen Adigier and it was on like lighters and hats and flags and blankets. And it's like the minute you do that phase is in phase, right? It isn't this like family, it isn't, it's just like, we've, we've sold out. And the minute we've sold out, to be honest, like this thing is, is, is broken and it'll be really hard to build that trust back. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to balance that with commercial efforts and don't be wrong. Like we want to become a hundred million dollar company in the next five years, but there'll be certain milestones that we need to hit before we do that. Mm, yeah, that's really true. And I guess you've, you've always got to keep that balance in check, right? I mean, who, who does that internally with phase? Is there one person who's like the head of culture or the head of content or the head of, I don't, I don't exactly know how to say it, but the head of the secret source of phase that you have to have those internal arguments or discussions with all the time. Yeah. So I think it goes to the early phase members, uh, people like phase banks, phase apex, uh, phase temper, um, but then there are people uh, internally, there's a guy named Tav who works very closely with them, who is, he's just a special human being. He's so tapped into to culture and celebrities and he just, he lives and breathes face clan. He's been at the company two years and, you know, he's just made such a, a huge mark. Now, the person who creates all of the magic sauce is a guy named Femi Akusanya, who is our head of content, VP of content, and he is supremely talented. And he also has to balance not only creating content for some of the channels, um, but he has to balance the brand stuff. And don't get me wrong, we now work with Nissan and Verizon. You know, sometimes, mm-hmm. you know, they're more conservative brands. Like, how do we tell our story without them controlling our channels, right? So Femi, Femi cre- he creates the magic sauce. He is a legend. And to give you context of how quickly our company's grown, like my, my team is not that much larger than when we last spoke. Like we're roughly like 10 people. He has like 20 people that work on his group and there's four of them a year ago. Yeah, so, but you know, he still has to answer to our, our CEO. Um, he still has to answer to JC, our COO, and then the early phase guys who, you know, they have a say, 
And, you know, that is, you know, there's a, a lot of cooks in the kitchen, if you will. Um, and everybody knows when it's not right. Like, you know, I'm not uh, our target audience um, of a lot of our content, but I can look at it sometimes and I'm like, Eesh, no, no cringe. And if cringe gets up, there's heads to pay. Mm-hmm. Cool. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, that's right. So it, yeah, I guess it makes sense. You were saying, you know, a content team of 20. How, how deep does that go with, with your creators? You know, you guys have, I mean, how many influences do you have as a whole now? You've including, even in, not including your esports players, you've got to have like 30 plus. So like you mentioned that, that you try to support your guys as best as possible. How deep does that go with content, with management, but also how deep does that go with sponsorship? You know, can, can, um, you know, your phase member in Australia request a Nissan to create some content with and roll around in or, or how does that work? Totally. And it just, it just depends on where that particular talent is at in their trajectory, right? If it's an early talent, like, um, you know, we, we do in-house management, right? And we actually have a, a, a particular guy named Jordan Galen who works with a lot of our up and coming guys. So mm-hmm. who are, you know, arguably they're like 14, 16, 18 year old kids who, you know, they're just making content. They don't know how to tag certain things, how to not get, um, you know, digital rights, get claiming against their content. Like, what is the cadence they do? How often do they want to stream? When do they want to compete? Yeah. So, like, because we're doing 360 management in-house, um, you know, we give them a lot of guidance. And don't get me wrong, some of these kids, and they are kids, um, you know, aren't receptive or they want to do things their own way. And that's fine, right? They're, they're clearly, you know, one of the top creators for a good reason. Now, when it goes into brands, right? So the way that it typically works is uh, FaZe does a deal with G Fuel, for example. Part of our G Fuel deal in, in includes working with over 13 of our content creators. They have monthly deliverables. If they ever need product or they want a car to shoot or they want a free Verizon phone or, you know, they want Beats headphones, like we make sure that that's available for them. Um, and we do get some interesting asks and, you know, those are, are, you know, we're happy to do it. Um, I always use like rug and G fuel as an example, um, you know, G fuel and rug, he's on their can. It's one of the best flavors that they have. They will go to him or he'll go to them and be like, Hey, can I, uh, can I get $20,000 to shoot this type of content? And here's what I want to do with G fuel. And so you see those types of examples. You see it more on the older guys who always ask. Um, and then, you know, a lot of the guys who are building their own content, like that's our core priority. Like we, we care about face clan, but at the same time, we care about, you know, you building your, your, your personal brand. Like we want face Bug to be the biggest superstar. We want face Nick Merckx to be the biggest superstar. And you know, sometimes that lends into our content. Sometimes it doesn't. I like that. I like that thing that you said about Phase Rug reaching out to G Fuel asking for money to do something cool. It, it's something I've been trying to push a lot of my friends who are influencers to do. Like, I mean, the closest example for us was working with Unicorn, a wagering company last year, around a couple of days before Christmas, we did a thing with the Fortnite guy where, you know, you could, if you're over 18, you could register for an account, go into the running to play live on stream. And then if you win a game of Fortnite, you win $2,000. And while that money doesn't directly go to the creator, because usually when they're newer, that's what they're thinking every time. It's how can I get an extra $500 a month? How can I get an extra $10,000 once off? But I'm trying to push more people to do exactly that same thinking. How can you get budget to help to push you to either become a bigger creator, make your fans happier with you, or another way, like a fantastic thing that, that, that Ross did, who took over for me at Corsair and now is at is at ASUS was he had a budget every quarter to go into his Corsair sponsored streams and just drop a ton of free subs to people. Great. You drop 500 free subscriptions and then you, that means the audience would love it as well as the, the streamer gets more sub points. The streamer also gets 50 to 75% of that money coming through as well. So they don't get that extra direct thousand dollars a month for tweeting once more or whatever, depending on what your scale is. But you know, it, it it adds so much more. I dropped you there for saying it. Um, that, that, no, you're, you're 100 right, and I think I think sometimes I think you feel you know sometimes the creators don't necessarily feel comfortable. And I have um, a, an example of what, something that has nothing to do with Phase Clan, but actually to do with G Fuel. Um, they started partnering with David Dobrik uh, two months ago, and he gave away announcing the partnership. I think he gave away two or three Teslas, but you had to follow him and G Fuel. And like mm-hmm. you know, G Fuel big brand on Instagram, big big brand on Twitter. He, they added like a million and a half followers in a single day. And some of them are going to drop off afterwards. Some of them are not. And, you know, so it's all about like building that, that relationship. And I think that's the thing with like gaming that I definitely didn't understand, like the community relationship between 
the fan, the streamer, and the brands that are interacting. And like, if you're creating value for the streamer and, you know, creating content, and then you're creating value for their fan base. And, you know, case in point, we talked a little bit about, about rug, but like, if you ever watch a, a stream with Nick Merckx, I mean, his M fam, which is, mm. you know, his community, that's why he has 60,000 subs and he loves them and they love him back. And, you know, so the, his partners that come in, like need to understand that that relationship and, you know, if, if it feels cringe or it feels, you know, that relationship is being interrupted, it's not going to work. But if they come in and think about what do his fans want? What game is he playing? Like, how do we see him a little bit out of his element and the brand is funding that? I mean, holy shit, that's magic. And that's why people are in marketing. Mm, that's true. And, you know, for anyone listening, the when Jeff talks about subs on, on Twitch, they're paying subscribers. So doing the really quick math here, 60,000 subscribers at the minimum amount they could subscribe, which is four ninety nine a month. At the minimum split, which is 50-50 between him and Twitch, is 149,700 USD per month from paying subscribers that, that are coming in. And it's only growing for him all the time. It's not just the fact of, you know, I think we saw this with, was it Shroud on Ninja that was really trying to get to that, you know, world record of subs and yeah, they reached a massive amount, but they dropped off. But it seems that Nick's audience is, is so hardcore. And, um, you know, I've got a few friends who I know that watch him and it seems that you either only watch Nick Merckx or you don't watch him. His fans yeah. are just so crazy dedicated. Yeah. And you know, for us, like, uh, when, when he came into the fam, right, came in at, right at the tail end of the Tifu lawsuit, like he came in and, you know, I'd been a little bit burned, I think, in a previous experience, with another esports team. And we weren't really sure to like how to embrace him. And I think we've really like prioritized that because he is he is a talent, right? If you watch him, like you said, like if if you're a Nick Merckx fan, that's who you watch. Like there is one other person and, you know, I always hear some of your math. And the thing that I always think is really funny is that you think uh, how much money these guys are making just on subs. So every big streamer doesn't have a normal standard deal. Um, they have marketing agreements. So you can do the math and like envision like what they make and times it by two, maybe triple it. So the money that some of these guys are making on these platforms is, you know, big, big guys. And I don't have insight into to Nick's deal per se, but like the, the ninja money, you know, the $10 million a year is, you know, some of the biggest names are, are scratching that. And, you know, I, I mean, if you would have told me three years ago that one, that these guys be making that type of money just from one revenue source, right? They still publish content on YouTube. They still do brand deals. I mean, the, the money in gaming is staggering. Like I, I've even gone and, and asked certain talent, I'm like, Hey, can we partner up to do something? And they're like, yeah, that'll be, Two hundred thousand dollars for an hour, and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> really? So yeah. um, it's it's great to see you know the maturation of the market and then the money coming in, and we just you know we talked about it last time. It's like we got to make sure that we don't fuck this up. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah, that's really true. Yeah, that's really true. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned like that, and that and that's why I love to use those minimums for exactly that same thing. It's like, look, here's the exact provable minimum that he could be getting. And then it's up from there. And that's so much more the minimum when I talk to, like I talked to Goldman Sachs yesterday from the U S you know, been doing some work with KPMG and that just blows their minds, you know, case studies like that case studies, like my friend who's a Minecraft YouTuber who I posted on LinkedIn, who is 23, doesn't know how to write an invoice. Um, doesn't have a proper accountant, although I wish he would have one, but he just bought a house. He bought a four bedroom house in cash last week. You know, it's a nice two-story house. It's brand new. <laughs> and then the Lambo is coming next. But hey, he bought the house in cash first. And, you know, it, previously before that, he lived with his parents and looked after his little brother while creating content. His overheads are zero. He doesn't have an editor. He creates all of his own content. You know, he doesn't, he kind of has management, but but not hands-on management at all. Most of it's just coming brands that are just emailing him saying, hey, can you show off this app for five grand? And and even like you were saying, the quirky ways that these guys do business, even even as his friend, I talk to him and say, hey, I've got, like I had Kapaski antivirus. Hey, I've got Kapaski here. Is that someone you want to do a deal with? And he's like, tell me how much they want to pay. And I'll tell you yes or no. Yeah. And I'm like, what's your price? And he's like, nope. Just tell me a number. And if I feel like doing it, I'll say yes. <laughs> that's, that's literally all he does. I do think that's changing, right? And you're seeing like some of the bigger like talent agencies, like UTA had like a really early head start on it. Um, you know, Darren Yon, who runs our talent department, like he, you know, he worked yeah. there as part of an acquisition. Um, you know, we do 360 management. You know, we want to make sure the best practices. Um, that Those types of deals are happening less and less, especially with the bigger guys. Um, you see like the yeah. roster what loaded has, you see that combined with UTA and then you see the roster that we have. And it's like, um, the price of admission has significantly gone up. Like, yeah. 
you know, in 2019, we had $1 million client. We have seven this year. And, you know, the price of admission to do an exclusivity contract with us goes and ranges anywhere between two and $5 million a year. Mm. And um, we make it work and we deliver value. And, um, you know, hopefully those brands feel like they're getting their, their value and our fans receive them and they building equity. And, um, you know, we're getting really good at inserting brands into our content and into our flow, but without like forcing it. And I think that's, that's just the balance because man, we, as we all know, gamers, if they feel like they're being sold to, they can be really tough. And the last thing I do is publish that type of content, which is why we sometimes need to hold ourselves accountable to like the early phase guys, the owners of the company who, you know, I'm a monetization guy. I got, I'll sell everything. I'll sell the house. I'll sell the car. I'll sell the cell phone. You know? So, um, it's good that they're there. Yeah. And I think it's a big change between the way that formula one teams work or or other racing teams versus esports. I've used, I've used that example for, I don't know, five or 10 years now where you see a formula one team has like, how many logos do they have on the, on their Jersey, on their cars, they've got hats, they've got bracelets, they've got everything is sold, you know, and, and you see this with say V8 supercars in Australia is always example I use. You can't see the car for the logos. There's like a $20,000 logo that's sold on the skirting board at the front end. And there's another one that's sold on the back end and things like that. But it doesn't work like that. I mean, look at the jersey that's hanging behind you. There's one brand on the front of that. Um, and exactly. if you look at a lot of other, they're like that too. Now. So we have, we have four partners that are on our jersey. Um, you know, we have G Fuel, Nissan, Verizon, which is a, a new entrant. And then we have Steel Series uh, on the, the left and right. Um, hmm. But you got to think like what an offering of like an esports, it's still different than a traditional sports sponsorship. Like, especially from a revenue perspective. And if we can use like the Lakers, for example, I think the number is, it was like, I think it's might be two or three years like dated. I think they made like $130 million a year or something like that. And they were cash flow positive, but the way that they make money is completely different than the way that I make money. They make their money mm-hmm. from their television deal, which pays them, you know, 50, $60 million a year. They then have their arena that they, you know, either own or they rent that they then make another 30 million. That's the part of the equation that we're gonna have to figure out on like the esports side, uh, yeah. which is like, is it profit sharing from the publishers in, in an elevated capacity? Um, and that's been kind of an eye-opening thing for me in the in the last like little bit is just the power of the publishers. Like I know that Twitch is the almighty on the streaming side, but if Riot yeah. says, hey, I, I don't like that, take it down, they're in control. If Activision's like, hey, no, you're not gonna do that, they're in control. And, you know, I didn't understand that even until about five months ago and I've seen it. And I think, you know, working very closely with Riot was really impressive to watch the, they're like the NFL here. Everything is like, it's end to end. It's like the Apple way, right? So, you know, Shazam, when I was there, we sold it to Apple. And when I went into Apple and like, I only worked there at the very end for like a month or two while I transitioned the, the company, like everything was thought out from end to end to end. And then you come into gaming and it's like oh, the wild, wild west, right? Like nobody has can explain what is taking place, the why, the madness, the fra- fragmentation. And I, I think for the model to work to where we can have multiple hundred million dollar, you know, teams, media companies existing, you know, we're going to need to figure out like how we interact with the publishers or at some point we're going to need to create our own IP and our own games because that's the only way we can make money. Like we're just going to be a talent management company. Um, we're that's not a good business long term to exclusively be in, right? That's really true. And you know, talent management company, I think you know, is something that I've talked to my board about. And actually, one of my friends um, who's got a very successful talent management company who's considering selling at the moment. If you don't have a brand that's attached to that. You know, A, you're not making that much margin. If you're selling those massive deals as a talent manager, often you're doing anywhere from 5 to 15%. And B, what are you selling besides a roster that you own that once those contracts are up, that they can just go to someone else? And I think, uh, and I know he's watching at the moment, but I don't want to mention who it is, but I, I feel like, and after talking to him, he's a little bit disheartened at the moment because it's like, I can do $4 million worth of brand deals, get 700K revenue through, but I can only sell the company for a million to a million and a half. So it's not really worth that much in the end, and you know, because it's not attached to a brand. Like, what do you actually own, and what can you sell off? And it makes sense. You're talking about, you know, this 
diversification, which is something I talked about with every esports team so far, right? Where you've got that media IP and assets you own, you've got those games, you've got those shows on Netflix, you've got your own merchandise that you're releasing, the collabs, you've got the phase YouTube channel itself and the house and the OGs that live in that. Um, and then now you're talking about possibly diversification into apps and games and things like that too. You know, it makes sense. You do own so many assets that you can wrap up into the company. I, I think, you know, being in an agency business, which if, if like, you know, an advertising agent, a talent agency, just a tough thing to scale. And then, you know, you even see companies like WME um, and Endeavor who wanted to IPO last year and yeah. the appetite for va- the value that they were seeking was restricted because the bulk of their revenue comes from their talent side. And, you know, I, I think that's something for me that we, we analyze and think about a, a lot, which is, you know, like yeah. what creates not only revenue, but enterprise. Right. And, you know, we all have these really high valuations, like a phase is, is valued at over 250 and cloud nine is like 350. And I, but I do think, you know, you're seeing a lot of pressure and there's been a huge, I don't want to go into names or places, but there's been a massive turnover at people in my position at some of those competitive teams and uh, the leagues more recently. Like it's a, it's a game of moving chairs. The primary reason for that is that nobody's making money and nobody sees the consistent revenue and they're probably seeing client churn, which is something we talked a lot about the last time. And we've been very fortunate to not feel that our clients are coming to us being like, Hey, we want to go deeper with you, which makes my job a little bit easier. But you know, the, the pure esports side, that's why, you know, if you look at like who's benefiting right now in the midst of COVID it's creators, right. Uh, who are mm-hmm. audiences are scaling, you know, their monetization might be going down Twitch streamers who you look at the audience numbers like maybe like three months ago and I think everybody was just like, I need content. There's no sports. I mean, I remember going on like Nick Burke's channel one day, he had 140,000 people watching his stream. And then I go, it was right on the Valorant drop. Um, and it was like Summit had 250,000 people watching his stream. And I'm like, that was unheard of six months ago. So I look at the creators who are really benefiting. They're seeing more audience, more eyeballs. Hopefully, you know, when the economy recovers a little bit, they'll also see significant um, you know, monetization, but then, you know, these platforms, man, like the creators who are plugged in those platforms, you know, their CPMs are going down a little bit, but like what's taking place on Twitch now, it's like, man, it's, it's just chatting. It's music. It's like EDM festival and their business is beautiful for a variety of reasons. One, you know, they, they make money off the subs, but they're a media company, right? That's how Twitch makes all their money. Um, mm. and, you know, they do have a sponsorship arm and they're very good at the like, rivals products and, and monetization. I know a bunch of them over there. We've done some stuff with them, but like their bread and butter is programmatic uh, video, just like YouTube. And um, you know, when you have a lot of people watching your stuff, regardless of what happens to the CPMs, you're going to make money hand over fist. And I, I'm going to be very curious to see, you know, will, will they re- release those earnings on Twitch? Um, and then, you know, then the other monetization bucket is publishers who are just absolutely crushing it. Like you see what's happening with Activision, EA, we're about to have, you know, two new consoles in the marketplace. I mean, good God, gaming is, is having a moment. And like I, I said, and apologize for my language again, we just gotta make sure we don't fuck it up. We just gotta make sure that, you know, this is the path to, you know, investment. And this is the path to, um, you know, more brands coming in and they're not coming in for the right reasons, not just cause there's, people are locked in their homes. Yeah. Sorry about that. Cutting off I've, as, as with Australian internet. Um, so often I don't have um, my, my landline isn't working today. So I'm tethering off my phone. And then whenever you get a phone call, it drops out the stream, which is always, which is always uh, super helpful. I'm, I'm in, yeah. in this rural neighborhood, man. And like I get, have no internet. So if my like daughter decides she wants to turn on the TV upstairs, like I'll be all pixelated and it's probably why I'm a little blurry right now. So beautiful in this age of internet, huh? Living in first world countries, barely able to talk. Hello. 5G, man. Verizon 5G. That's the only one you got to think about. So (laughs) there you go. Perfect. So I guess like, um, you know, like I want to talk about, want to talk about two more topics. The second one's a bit more personal, but, but first let's, let's wrap it up with the, with the phase chat. So you said last year, you guys made a lot of mistakes in basically just pushing out too much. Bye, bye, bye. What, what mistakes are you guys making right now? This, this day, what are you trying to fix? That's an interesting question. I think, you know, more often than not, we're thinking about what is next, right? Like we, we're having a great year, um, you know, knock on wood, you know, our company is scaled in the midst of, you know, the ad market is a bad place. 
I mean, it is a bad place to be working in media and advertising sales agencies. You're a media publisher and BuzzFeed, like all of these places are like hemorrhaging. They're down 30, 40, 50%. What we're trying to figure out are this like holding company, you know, model. It's like, what areas can we make a few additional million dollars that can then scale? Right. And, uh, you know, this year we've run four proof of concepts that have been really important to our business. The one, the first, the first one that we really ran is we partnered with Verizon on the pay it forward live, which was a, a series. It was a weekly series where they rotated between music and gaming and they would create these like live streaming mini events. And it basically, uh, forced us to double down on live. So we introduced a product called phase live, um, where we'll produce content, we'll do programming. It'll run on phase clan. So we really wanted to like build up our phase um, main channel, which is something surprisingly, we hadn't done content there in like years. Um, that then led into our next proof of concept, um, which was uh, around, could we run our own tournaments? And we did, you know, the Valorant Ignition series that, uh, you know, what we talked about before did really well, shattered all records. We, you know, they did, I think 15 of them across the world. And I think we had two and a half times the largest audience that took place of any of those events. So again, Proof of concept. Um, you know, we have a movie that's coming up, Crimson, um, with a, you know, uh, it's another proof of concept. Like, can we introduce a, a direct to consumer movie offering that, you know, can we produce movies utilizing our talent? And it goes back to, you know, pushing energy drinks or pushing, you know, keyboards or mice. Can we, can we push people to buy a movie? And can we make that movie good enough to where we can build a franchise? Like, why is Marvel big? Because they have built in fans. So when you release a new movie, the fans are going to go see it. And don't get me wrong, like we're, I'm not comparing us to Marvel, but you know, it is using fan base, it's using community to then build a product. So we're going to see if that proof of concept and how, how that ultimately like shakes itself out. And all of these things into 2021 are going to be, when we work with brands, can we, you know, not only create original content for them, can we create short form content? Can we leverage phase live? Can we do digital tournaments that a brand owns and underwrites and it becomes a, you know, uh, like them investing in the NBA finals or like um, big, big sporting event. And so all of these things combined are like really like the trajectory for not only 2021, but 2022. And, you know, we want this to be a hundred million dollar company in the next few years and um, not value, uh, cause we're already way above that, you know, almost 300 million bucks, but actual revenue. And, um, you know, I think we probably have the biggest shot at doing so. Mm, yeah. Interesting. And I guess to, you know, like wrap up one of the, the topics that we talked about quite a bit before going live was around imposter syndrome. And we're seeing that much more and to, and to like put a little bit of a different spin on it, I guess there's a weird imposter syndrome that I've felt now that I've been able to get into rooms with people like yourself, Clinton Sparks, you know, PPD, X Dota 2, international winner, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And these people I get to meet where it's imposter syndrome on the fact of if these people are talking to me, they mustn't be who they say they are. You know, Clinton mustn't have access to offset. He must be lying about that. You know, right. this PPD, you know, he mustn't really want to be my friend. Like there's no way that he's hitting me up on Discord asking for my advice on new ventures he's going into and stuff. So I found that really weird on my side. But but for you, obviously, coming from the traditional industry straight to, you know, really near the top of the food chain um, with with FaZe, like how did how did you work with that? Was that a bit of a struggle? Yeah, you know, I actually, you know, when we last spoke, it would have been a year ago, I remember I was like super nervous and I knew what I was talking about, but you know, I had, uh, I'd scaled two businesses prior to that. I was at a, a social data company called share this. We scaled it, uh, into, you know, almost hundred million dollar company. I went to Shazam. We then sold that to Apple. And then, you know, I came in and, but those were like startups or they were rebuilds. This was a company that was like this massive brand in gaming one that I didn't truly understand in a industry that I truly didn't understand. And I remember just not having the confidence that I knew what I was talking about. Like I knew how to build businesses and project management and working with engineering and working with product and looking at data and analytics, but I didn't understand gaming as a whole. And you, I think for me, it took me a solid like nine months to get, you know, my feet under the, the skis, if you will. And, um, you know, all of the things that I, 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 I was second guessing are, it's now changing. And I'm like, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm building. I have the confidence and support amongst the other executives that that were that I'm going to do what I need to do to make you know my team and this company successful. And but it is a weird feeling. Like 
I, imposter syndrome is, is real. And the funny thing with gaming is that there are really no experts. Like, I don't care if you, if you've been a gamer for your, the next 20 years, gaming business, like, you know, my boss is probably the closest thing to that at JC Hayes. Like she's been in gaming since 1996. She might be like one of the very few people that have actually scaled and built these businesses while the rest of us are, you know, like phase is different than any company in the, on the internet. Like it just is like, I don't care. Like hundred thieves is a clone of us, a less, a less scale clone of us. Um, and you know, but at the same time, like they're figuring it out. Like I talked to Maddie Lee over there, like he, you know, he's got the same challenges that I have. And the turning point I think was honestly, it was like interacting with people like yourself. It was interacting with, you know, just being open, right. And understanding, I, I knew what I didn't know. And, um, then you're going to finally turn the corner and, you know, then I have talent coming to me. I have brands coming to me. Like, what do you think? And, and I surprised myself. I'm like, holy shit. Did I just say that? Uh, did it work? Um, and I'm like, Oh, that is a really good idea. And, you know, I, I was, I did a panel not that long ago and I told my story and I was like, if your brand that hasn't played video games ever, uh, but you're curious, you're gaming curious, if you will, um, you know, uh, just ask the right questions, surround yourself with good people and understand that there are no true experts in what we're building right now because it has never been done before. Mm, mm, that's true. And it, and it's also the fact the market just changes so often, right? And I think that, you know, we, we talked about this a little bit before of something that I've experienced myself, which is people who've been around in the industry for a long time are scared of becoming irrelevant. So I think they go out and they attack, you know, hashtag esports consultants and they, they go and tell brands that they're not talking to the right people and who could possibly do this campaign. I could do it better, even though they don't have history. And, you know, I think that that gatekeeping is coming from that point of, of fear. And I had the same thing, you know, hitting 2018, you know, I was working at Corsair back with another brand, you know, some of my friends or people who are brand new to the industry were raising, you know, a million bucks to, to create an esports team in Australia. And I was like, that should be me. You know, I've been a commentator. I've played at top levels. I've managed Australian players. Like I deserve that. But you don't unless you go out and grab it yourself. Like simply just being in the space, if you haven't done anything with it, I mean, who cares in the end? So all the power to the new people who come. And then you should be able to position yourself as someone who mentors and works with those people. You could be like Jens Hilger, someone else who's been around forever, you know, who now leads Bitcraft. And they essentially is are a VC company that helps other companies grow within the space. So you can use that, that power and that history wisely. You don't have to be the person who's on every panel. You don't have to be the person that's the front page of every story and things like that. Yeah, I think, you know, as long as you're curious and you're well-intentioned and you're open-minded, like, you know, you're going to hopefully make it work. And, you know, then you feel more comfortable and, you know, I'm, I'm almost two years in the job and I can say like, I feel a different level of just like comfort in my decision-making and how I view the world. And sometimes I, I, I still have glimpses of like, Oh, that's, 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 a, you know, not the right way, but mm. you know, I'm a, I'm a smart business guy. I built businesses in the past. I've managed really big teams and, you know, we just need to, to make sure that, you know, that we're, we're all doing, we're, we're all, we're all taking a step back and being like, okay, we know what we're doing. And, you know, it's a, you know, hopefully, you know, if you're, if you're watching this or you're listening to the podcast and you just want to talk, then, you know, just let me know, reach out. I'm, I always try to go up some of my time, um, at least once a week. So, um, mm. what do you think we're going to be doing in a, in a year from now, Chris? What, 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 what game are we going to be playing? <laughs> I mean, who, I mean, who knows, man, like, like with my company, we're going along a very similar trajectory to what you're talking about, which is, you know, I've explained it to people that the big esports is almost functioning like a VC and, and um, growth capital companies putting in business development and sweat equity instead of capital. So there are definitely some likenesses between what you are doing. You know, there are certain projects that we own that we're working on that we're getting other people to help us with and providing them with some equity to do things that we're not good at. And the other way around as well too, you know, there's people that are reaching out to us saying, hey, we want to give you some equity. You guys are great in this area. We'll do the boring back end stuff. You can do the front end to work on. And I, I feel like that's something that, you know, so many more people are doing and they're going to have these assets that they can buy and sell and trade. 
you know, there's no reason why you guys can't have a merchandise division that you can sell off to someone else to to run the back end for entirely. There's no reason that you can't sell off your movie company in the future. Um, the same thing that, you know, we're working on some merchandising companies, some gambling plays and some reality shows and some other things too that we can do the same with. But as for like game and stuff, I mean, it's, you know, it'd be hard to look past Fortnite because of the, the amount of innovation they're doing in the space, right? But you never know, you know, Among Us, you know, was kind of a dead on release game that was, you know, by a small developer and boom, it's exploded. I, you know, the, the, and I guess the other thing really backing up, like what you said about how they can never be a gaming expert. I didn't think Fortnite would be big. I looked at it and went, nah, I don't really like it very much. Looks pretty cartoony, a bit dumb. Well, boy, was I wrong. So don't don't come to me if you if you want to pitch a new game. Let, let me tell you that I can I can follow the trends and I can see them when they're early, but I certainly don't set the trends. That's that's not me. Yeah, I'm I'm exactly the same way. I mean, I watch, observe, and then bring brands into the fold and um, help them tell the right the story the right way. So yeah, yeah, that's good. Well, that's a good place to wrap it up. So if someone wants to connect with you online, um, yeah. wants to talk to you, or ask you the questions, where's the best place? LinkedIn, I assume. Yeah, just find me on LinkedIn. It's where it's where I I, uh, I probably spend the most amount of time off my social channels, especially given everything that's taking place in the world. So, um, yeah. yeah, I'd love to hear from you. Yeah, fantastic. Well, thanks for coming on, man. And we'll have to do this, I guess, in in uh, another three hundred and sixty three days. <laughs> CCA 2021, bro. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah, perfect. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. And thanks to everyone, whether you're tuning in live to the podcast, watching this on YouTube, or listening to the audio only version. Once again, we have new podcasts coming out every Thursday. Thanks for listening, guys. Bye for now. <laughs>